everyone, and welcome in to episode one of Coach Dell's Dugout Talk, where we will be talking everything baseball, a lot of different aspects of baseball, and uh, I believe today we have possibly the number one baseball guru in the Ohio Valley. Uh, uh, we're very happy to be joined by um, the assistant coach at Liberty University, Andrew Koalo. Uh, Andrew is a graduate of Wheeling Park High School. Uh, Potomac State University and finished his career at Liberty University where he is now uh, an assistant coach. Andrew, thank you for taking this time to join us as our number one guest here on Coach Dell's Dugout Talk. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is this is great. Um, Andrew's home on Christmas break and he's going to we're going to talk a little bit about some exciting things going to happen in his life. Um, but let's start out by, um, tracing your career. Let's talk about, uh, and I, uh, even, uh, even after we talk about how you got into coaching and your playing career, I want to talk, I want to circle back here in a little bit and talk about your love of the game, because I don't think I've ever seen a player that absolutely loves the game of baseball, uh, more than you, but, before we get into that, let's talk about your your career. Now you you know you started playing at Wheeling Park, and I mentioned uh, Potomac State, Liberty University. Uh, take us take us through um, your your steps from Wheeling Park uh, to where you are now. Oh, I mean, I could start all the way back to freshman year and we yep. playing fall baseball. Um, there was a couple fall ball teams that we had, and going up for practice. And I remember one day I was out there and taking ground balls and this guy came out he's like, let me show you something. And he showed me how to do a prep step, which is one of the most basic things that infielders ever do. And I didn't know that prior to coming up to Wheeling Park. And that was you. Um, I don't know if you remember that you came out to shortstop and you kind of showed me the, the first little step of how to play oh, baseball at the next level. I, I actually don't remember that, but uh, my memory's not very good. I don't but. know if Coach Stout talked you into going up and doing it and seeing uh, see him practice that day or what, but it was uh, it's something I always remember because um, it was the first time I remember ever really having true coaching. Yeah. And that was something that has always stuck with me, and then obviously I got to play with you down the road. But anyways, back to Wheeling Park, and that's where it all started. Um, you know, Coach Stout, Coach Myers – those were my first true coaches that I remember, and I got lucky enough to play for them for two years and did more pitching at that time than I did um, hitting an infield. But um, over the time, kind of progressed to doing both. Coach McLeod took the program over my junior year, um, so I got two years with Coach McLeod. And he also is one that you know helped me a, a, a lot along the way, especially with the recruiting aspect, because that was my junior and senior year where – those are the two years that, you know, you start putting yourself out there for colleges to see you. Uh, he provided me opportunities to go and get myself in front of, um, you know, many different schools. Yep. And, um, you know, American Legion baseball also mixed in there. I was lucky enough, played five years of American Legion, a couple for Coach Pasco, one for you, um, and just kind of did the Ohio Valley baseball circuit. So that was – you know, the early days of, of my baseball career. Okay. And then, um, and that's interesting. And there's, there's a whole lot more to, to that. And I appreciate that, uh, that memory. I'll, I'll, I don't actually remember that, but it's nice to know that I was, uh, at least said one thing in, in, in your life that you listened to. So, um, so you're, you're playing, at Wheeling Park, and I knew when I saw you the the, the first time I saw you, I, I knew you were a special player. I just could tell the way you handled yourself on the field. Uh, your size was a, a big advantage for you. You know, you were tall, you were lanky, uh, and you just had that that baseball look to you. You know, when you see a guy on a field that has that baseball look, he carries himself like a player. You know, right away. So I I knew at that point that you were really, really going to be something special. Uh, so you get to your junior and your senior season at Wheeling Park. Tell, tell us a little bit about uh, your, you know, the, the, the college, how 
you know, you the colleges started to reach out to you. What what made your decision to go to Potomac State? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was a really slow process. This area, unfortunately, just there weren't a ton of kids prior to me that I was able to see how the process worked. So for me, I felt like I was a little bit behind um, on the whole recruiting process. So I went to a Coastal Carolina camp and it was okay. I, I was young. I was small. I was weak. I definitely didn't stand out down there um, at a camp with a hundred kids. So it was good experience for me to kind of get those nerves of going to camps and that kind of thing out of the way. But it really started when some of the local um, Mountain East Conference schools were reaching out. I had you know Fairmont, Wheeling, and West Liberty were my three visits that I took in this area, and you know. I just didn't know if I wanted to stay around home or if I just wanted to, you know, roll the dice and bet on myself and um, got invited down to a West Virginia baseball camp and thought, oh, maybe I'll go there if I have a chance. There was uh, no chance of me going there, but that's where Coach Little at Potomac State saw me. And he called and said, hey, here's the deal. Here's how we kind of run our program. It gives you, you know, keeps the door for Division One open. Come play here for two years, develop, get bigger, get stronger, get your school under your belt and and see where it can take you. And I thought that was like the best thing I could have ever heard at that point, because it was keeping all my opportunities open to to still play at the Division One level, which was always my goal in the back of my head. I just never knew if it was ever going to be possible if it would ever happen. So, um, you know, going junior college and playing at Potomac State was my avenue to get there. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. How. um and this is probably real fine line. How do you would you tell a player that is coming out of high school to potentially go to a junior college as opposed to a four year college? Is there is there a um, a talent level or a, a, a gap there that the junior college fills that that makes you the the better player to be able to play at the Division One level? Is that is that where you felt would benefit you as as a juco player yeah there was a couple things for me that went into it um you know i don't mean this in a negative way but i felt like if i would have stuck around home and played that would have been the end of my baseball career like i would have right. never had a chance to right. play potentially professionally i was just gonna you know play my four years enjoy it graduate and really worry more on my degree than anything and and at the time i just wanted baseball um and so one was what I wanted, and two was I really hadn't developed yet. Um, I was still right. only 175 pounds, I think, when I left high school, and I left junior college at 220 pounds. So the, the extra two years of development for me was the biggest thing. I added weight, added strength, and all that kind of goes into playing and being ready. I would have never been ready to play Division One college baseball as an 18-year-old. I would have gotten red-shirted or cut after the fall, 100%, just because of – my size, I was weak, I wasn't strong, and I was probably way behind the eight ball compared to most kids out there at that level. So the junior college route was what gave me that little bit of extra time to take the steps I needed to to get there. So then uh, Potomac State, you, you actually you had a very good career at Potomac State. Talk a little bit about your experience at P Potomac State and what um, – what you learned at coach, I know you and coach little were very, ended up being very good friends. You coached for him for several years. I know he taught you a lot. You saw, you've seen the progression of Potomac state, the facilities, the, 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 you know, the, um, the quality of the play has improved greatly. So talk a little bit about Potomac state and what that meant to you. Oh, I mean, they, uh, I'm really close with them. Um, they, they really took me in under their wings and, what I thought I knew going there about the game of baseball was was super small. Once you right. get there, I mean, they break it down. And, and the way that they joke around about it is they teach you like you're a kid that knows nothing about baseball. That's when you get there, they're going to teach you every step of the game on the physical side, on the mental side, which was my biggest thing. Um, the mental side is something that it takes a special coach to be able to truly teach the mental side of the game. And now as a coach, I look back at them and try and use a lot of the stuff that I learned from them and that they taught in their program, just even on like a daily routine basis kind of thing, like how to get to the ballpark, when to get to the ballpark, should you be, you know, an hour early, two hours or early, um, you know, learning how to do things for yourself and, 
and pack your own bag. That was the one thing we had there. They always called it the Navy SEAL mentality. Like in your baseball bag, you should have everything you could possibly need. An extra pair of shoelaces, um, extra bottles of water. If your one glove breaks, have an extra glove so that you don't have to delay the game. Like you're just always prepared for whatever's going to happen. And that was something that sticks to me today. Um, I overpack for everything I do now. And I'm also always really early. My wife doesn't like that because <laughs> she's the opposite. She I shows know the up feeling. 15 minutes late. I and know I the feeling. A half hour early. Drives and, you crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I love those perspectives right there. And I want I want to hit when we go into your your coaching philosophy, I want to talk a little bit more about that. And it's interesting that uh, that your experience at Potomac State. So then you you finish out your career at Potomac State. Um, you obviously have two years left of playing. Talk about how you ended up at Liberty. Yeah, honestly, it was a little bit by luck. Um, I didn't know that Liberty even existed at the time. This was back in the fall of 2014. I was a 20 year old kid who, you know, thought he had a good freshman year and thought, you know, maybe something's going to happen. Um, you know, WVU being a, or Potomac State being a branch campus of WVU, I thought, hey, maybe I got a chance to go there. It had happened in the past with a lot of the players and it, it never really worked itself out. So, from there, I had to, you know, kind of narrow it down. Where do you want to go? How far from home do you want to go? Are you stuck on the plane at the Division One level? Would you consider going to the Division Two level? And there was a lot of decisions to be made. So um, I sat down with Coach Schaefer, who was the assistant at Potomac State, and we just kind of mapped it out. And luckily, with all their connections over the, they've been there for 25 years together, 25 years of sending players to schools year in and year out, they gained pretty good uh you know, relationships. So they were able to make calls for me and it narrowed down for me. I was either, I was either going to go to Pittsburgh and play uh, university of Pittsburgh, or I was going to go to Liberty. And when it came down to it, I just wanted to win. So I went and looked at their records over the last couple of years and Liberty had had a better record year in and year out had been to, you know, NCAA regionals and had players drafted. And that just sounded better to me. Um, and that's what basically made my decision for me. Okay, so you ended up at um, at Liberty University, and that, this is what I find interesting. And you're gonna you're, you're gonna correct me if I'm wrong. Did you end up playing? Did you end up playing all four infield positions at Liberty and uh, between Potomac and Liberty? Did you end up playing all four infield positions? And that's going to lead me into something very important that I'm going to ask you about. Yeah, I did. It's funny, um, you know. Coming up, I'd only really ever played shortstop, played some second base a little bit as a young player on Legion, um, but in high school was always shortstop. And then I get to Potomac State, and they have a shortstop who was a freshman All-American the year before. And I'm like, okay, where am I going to play? And ended up being third base. I got to play at third base after the first weekend because the third baseman broke his hand. Okay. And so it was. I got lucky because of an injury, ended up playing third base. And then you know I go to Liberty University, and they – tell me I'm going to be the shortstop. So I'm like, great, I'll come play shortstop. And I get there and the kid that's playing shortstop had played every game since his freshman year and he's going into his senior year. And I'm okay. like, well, that doesn't make any sense. So I got to find a different position to play. So I went over to second base. I also split time there at third base. And then my senior year, we got a whole new coaching staff and they must have thought I was too big and slow. And they gave me a first baseman's mitt. And I was a little uh, upset about that at first, uh, but I, I bought in and end up playing first base the entire fall of my senior year. And then again, because of an injury end up playing second base. So that's that. I think that's um, I, to a, I think it's commendable that you, you did, uh, you played all four positions, but I want you to tell if any young players are watching this or coaches are watching this, tell them how important it is for a player to be versatile to be work, not don't think you're going to play shortstop your entire career from high school through college. You might be asked, you might be asked to move to the outfield. So talk a little bit about how important it is for a young player to wear different gloves. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know me, I've got way too many baseball right, gloves. Right. So maybe that has something to do with right. it. But um, no, seriously, the, the, the openness and the willingness, I think it all just comes the drive. Like that's what it was for me. Like I had drive and it was fun. Like the game was always fun. Practice was fun. It was never a chore and it was never, you know, Oh man, I got to go do this today. Yeah. It was always, I can't wait to go do this. And you know, for me, any opportunity I got to play, I was, I was going to play even when I was 
I think playing Legion for you, my freshman year of college, I was going and playing in the OVB, OVBL also. So right. like any opportunity I got to play, I was taking it. And that, that rolls over into, you know, getting different opportunities on the field. And I think coaches see that. Um, you know, it's funny at Liberty, we have a joke with all of our catchers. If you're a catcher at Liberty, you're probably going to play left field at some point in your career because they can all hit. Right. You got to get the bats in the lineup. So we got a catcher in, in left field. We had last year, we had all three of our catchers in the lineup, one in left field, one in catcher and one playing first base. Let's see. So, so again, uh, for any of you young players out there that may be watching this, don't, don't pigeonhole yourself into being a shortstop or being a center fielder, be play as many positions as you can, because down the road, there may be a player that's better than you at a position and you may have to move over and and learn a new position or work in a new position so i think that's incredible that you ended up playing all four positions uh in college now let, let's talk a little bit about something you just mentioned a minute ago your love of the game i honestly besides my son jared i don't think i know any player that I've ever been around that loves the game more than you. And where did your where and I want to talk more about your love of the game and talk about the the, the amount of time you spent on a baseball field. Where did your love of the game start? I, I know that you when you take the field it's just always fun. It's never a chore as you mentioned. Where did your love of the game start when you were five, when you were six, when you were ten? When when did it start? I don't know. I, I... I hear from my mom and, and aunts and uncles that maybe were around when I was young and didn't really pay attention to anything. Um, you know, I would say probably at that five, six year old mark where, <clears throat> you know, my mom always remembers the story of like, we're playing a, a Pike Cubs Pinto game and I'm telling all the different players where they need to stand. <laughs> and nowadays I would kind of get mad at a kid like that, like shut up and just play. And, um, you know, back then it was, you know, Come home, throw the ball off the garage wall. All I bet night you beat. A, I bet you beat the steps up in a garage wall. Oh yeah, I, I was constantly ball off the wall. Um, but then also, like you know, I played three sports. Coming yeah, up. I played yeah, baseball, yeah. basketball, and football. And to me, that was because of my dad. My dad played three sports in college, and I knew that, and I saw that, and I'm like, oh, okay, that's what I want to be. And you know, nowadays that's pretty much impossible. Right, exactly. But just having all three you know, throughout my lifetime kept me spaced out as well. I wasn't just baseball all 12 months of the year. I was three months here, three months there, bouncing between summer league and winter leagues. And, um, you know, I think that was really good too. I would never personally tunnel a kid into one sport at a young age. At some point, yeah, I get specializing and, and uh, focusing really hard on just one sport like I did with baseball in college. But up until then, you know, I still played basketball. I played a year of golf in, uh, in high school. So just trying to, you know, do as much as I can. The athleticism factor is is uh, unmatched when it comes to the next level. Yeah, right. And so so that's that's interesting. And I think that's a really good perspective for for kids to get involved in all all three sports, you know, three major sports, but any other sport, wrestling, yeah. soccer, whatever, whatever other sport it is. I would say for me, that was how I kept from maybe getting that burnout. Yeah. Baseball that kept maybe my love for, OK, basketball season's over. Now I can't wait for baseball season to start. That's that's that, and that that I just kept, you know, in the back of my mind. And then, you know, when baseball season got maybe a little boring towards the end of the summer and you were kind of worn out. OK, here comes football. I don't have to really worry about baseball yeah. anymore. And that that's changed so much now, as you, you mentioned, Andrew, uh, you know, now baseball, basically, when you get to the, you know, with these travel teams and as they get a little bit older, Baseball becomes like a year-round sport for for these guys, which which I don't agree with, and I, I don't think you would agree with. But even though you're a baseball coach now, you know you're you're getting fall ball, then 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 the winter ball. You're trying to find a place to to work out. Then as soon as spring hits, you're you're into into high school, or if you're in middle school, wherever, and then then obviously summer baseball. So it's really become all year, and these kids now all think you know want to believe that they're going to be. Division one players, right. pro players. So I, I thoroughly agree with that. The three sport um, involvement. I really, I really think that's that's important. And I, you keep segueing me into uh, the things that I want to ask you. You talk, you talked about uh, your mother and your father being such a big influence. Now you, yeah. 
you sort of as me, I lost my father at a young age. You, your father passed away. At, how old were you? I was 11. That's about a uh, little, I was a little bit older, but uh, you know, I had to lean on my mother as you did and talk a little bit about your mother and um, what an influence, obviously your father was an influence on you growing up. And, you know, you told us a story on the radio the other day about how you learned to throw the ball to a certain spot because if you missed your dad's glove you had to go get it yep. so your your dad obviously was a big influence in your younger life but as you as you matured and got got older your mother was you know i know you and your mother are very very close which is which is really special and really neat but she's been such a big influence in your life talk a little bit about her and what's what she's meant to you for her and to me it's been just the openness to let me make my decisions and not try and be a helicopter parent in any way. Um, you know, she trusted me from a young age to do things that I probably would have never done. Um, like little things like cut the grass at 12 years old, getting on a big tractor and cutting an acre and a half on a, on a big mower. Like that was fun to me. She, her, she was terrified. The whole time. <laughs> um, but I think little things like that allowed her to, you know, give me the freedom, like my junior year summer, I went and lived in Charlotte for the whole summer and played on a team down there where she had kind of gotten over maybe some of those fears um, and kind of sh I was able to show her that I'm capable of doing some things. And that benefited me down the road when it came time when baseball opportunities came available, like I had to get out of here. I had to go play in other areas. And she was, you know, always open. She never really tried to influence me one way or another on my decisions on where I was going to go play in college. She just said, you know, I trust you. And she was always there to, you know, get in the car and drive me to the game. And, um, you know, she's a great cook. So whenever I can, <laughs> and, uh, no, I mean, I can't say enough about her. She's, uh, she's one of a kind and without her and honestly, without my dad, my dad's, you know, 11 years was not enough, but the 11 years of like the discipline. Right. And it, I think it made her job easier because I had a really good foundation from, from him and, you know, I was scared of him, you know, for, for my time with him. And, um, you know, that kind of continued to where I wasn't uh, a bad kid. I wasn't doing, you know, right, stupid things. Right. Um, she could trust me was the biggest thing. And that was all just because of them raising me. Right. That's, that's awesome. Now your mother, your mother was the number one woman in your life, obviously. Now you have a number two woman in your life that, um, uh, has become obviously a, a huge part of your life. And, uh, Let's let's talk about let's talk about your wife a little bit. Um, she, I never dreamed that you'd ever find a woman that would put up with you, uh, and uh, your baseball annex is like like your wife does. So talk a little bit about her and her how she's adapted to your lifestyle and how you've adapted to hers. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what else is coming down the road. I still don't know why she, uh, why she ever <laughs> fell for me, but, uh, it's funny. She came all the way I was coaching. At Potomac uh, let's State. talk about your wife who give her, let's talk about her name and where she's from. And well, it was Ashley her. Martin. Now it's, right. uh, Ashley Martin Koalo. Uh, we've been married for seven months, just about. Um, and she's, uh, she's from Wheeling. She yep. grew up here. We're, we're about the same age, but she went to Wheeling central. I went to Wheeling park. Um, never really kind of knew each other. And then after college, we, we met and the rest is history, but, um, you know, her putting up with my schedule, my, my weekly, you know, baseball schedule. I mean, I think it starts all the way back from when we met, um, I was coaching at Potomac state and she came to Kaiser, West Virginia, wow. and stayed in my little apartment with me and, wow. um, thought that, you know, this guy's cool. And I'm like, at that time I was, I was just kind of off by myself. I didn't yeah. have much going for me. I wasn't making any money. You know, I didn't have, have much going and somehow, you know, she stuck around, you know, there's months at a time. Sometimes we go without seeing each other. Um, that's just kind of the college baseball schedule with recruiting. She likes to come home cause our families are here. So, you know, when I'm not in Lynchburg or wherever we're at, she'll just jump in the car and come up here and spend time with family while I'm, you know, recruiting or gone for a couple weekends with, uh, with the team. Well, she's a, 
She's a special woman. I I, I don't know. Did, did she ever hit you fungos or thrown soft toss to you? No, she was a with basketball you? player. Yeah, she was. We've gone and we've gone and shot basketball, but uh, she's she's not the most competitive person, and I am. So no matter what I do, I make it competitive, <laughs> you're, you're and she doesn't like that. So we kind of stay away from the competitive sports. We've tried to play pickleball together. Um, well, she's not doing much of that right now. So no. let's uh, so let's talk a little bit about something coming up here that's. Uh, You've had a lot of really special things in your life, but you're about to probably embark on the most special thing that's ever happened to you here in about six weeks. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, six weeks away. Um, Ashley's 34 weeks pregnant right now. Baby's supposed to be due February 9th, so um, I keep saying it could come at any point um, in the next month or so. Um, and we don't we don't know the gender, right? Don't know the gender. Don't know the gender. And we're not going to know it till he or she comes. That's uh, right. Comes out, right? That's right. We're trying to keep it a surprise. You know, everybody has the opportunity to find out nowadays at 20 weeks, and we just said let's wait. And I think that's going to be an exciting, one of the most exciting thing that's ever happened. Oh my, to us. yeah, so yeah. You we're wait. looking forward to it. I know she's super uncomfortable and got the big belly right now, but overall she's done great um not not a lot of not a lot of hiccups or issues and it's been a pretty smooth pregnancy so that's, I, can't, uh, I can't complain that's awesome that you're uh you're married which could surprise coach stout coach myers and myself we never we never dreamed that would ever happen but now that you're going to be a father which uh obviously you're going to be a tremendous father uh, it's going to be exciting to watch you uh and i bet your mother is just uh man she's going to be to be a grandma, she's this is going to be a special time for her too. It is. It is. She's she's been excited. She can't wait to get in the car and drive down to Lynchburg and see her new uh, grandbaby. So Mimi, that's what we call her. She's uh, she's real excited. Oh, that's 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 awesome. So we wish you the best, there. Let's uh, let's swing back around to baseball a little bit here. As um, now you're uh, an assistant coach at Liberty. How, what? How many years have you been coaching at Liberty? This is year three for me. Halfway through year three. Year three, and uh, it's been a it's been a um, a, uh, a great experience for you. A learning experience. I'm sure you've you've learned a lot. I want to talk a little bit about um, you know now that you've been coaching a lot because I, I had the pleasure of coaching with you for a couple of years, American Legion, which you did a phenomenal job. Um, and you 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 uh, did you coach with Coach Little? You coach with Coach Little at Potomac for I did. Uh, three different seasons. I was in and out a couple of different That's times. What I, thought. I was okay. taking some different jobs and and all, but overall it was uh, throughout the course of three years. Okay, so as as you grow in the coaching world and you mature in the coaching world and see uh, the goods, the do's, and what what is your like? Do you watch uh, coaches to pick up little things that they do? That and I, I always thought when I was um, coming up as a coach, I would watch to see the things I don't want to do, which were just as important to me. The things I didn't like that coaches did that I learned from. But obviously, from the good coaches and the guys who, you know, make an influence on you, watching them and see how they handle players and you know their preparation and all the other things that go in. Where what? What has that been like for you? Well, I've, I've gotten to play for a lot of different coaches. And I think that, like you mentioned, has really helped combine together and make what I would call my coaching philosophy. I don't, I can't write my coaching philosophy down, but I can kind of explain it. Right. Um, you know, I've played for good. I've played for bad. I've right. played for hard nosed. I've played for what you call nowadays a, a player's coach. Um, you know, overall, I think. The biggest thing that has to be instilled is a respect factor. Um, nowadays, certain kids just don't have the respect towards their um, elders, I guess you could call it, or they're, they're people that are trying to help them at the end of the day. They've been catered to and, and kind of lost that lack of respect. So that's kind of one thing that I've tried to gain immediately with no matter which team I'm coaching is just, you know, trust what we're trying to tell you. Trust that we have your best interest at heart and we're trying to make not just you the best, but our team the best. And um, when you can get kids to show respect and buy in, those are kind of two things that go together. If they respect what you're saying and respect you as a person, when you start telling them things or trying to help them along the way, that's when you get the buy in and that's when you get the, you know, the, the interest level kind of perks up. So, um, you know, immediate respect i'm going to respect them i'm not going to you know dog them and you know i don't cuss at kids that's just not my style i didn't really like that as a player it didn't happen a ton, but it definitely does happen and it kind of turns you away nobody wants to 
to deal with that. So just uh, a respect factor going back and forth between each other um, and a trust. That's that's honestly what Coach Jackson, our head coach, preaches within our coaching staff is just the trust factor. Can I trust you as an assistant coach? Well, same thing as the players. Can the players trust us as coaches to tell them the right things and not lead them down a wrong path? Uh, I, I think that's, that's a really, really – Good philosophy, and I think respect respect of of your coaches, of adults. Of, it starts at home, then it starts at a young age, at, at, at little league, through middle school, through high school, and if those things are taught at home, especially, and then if you get coaches to continue to do that, it makes it a lot easier for for you guys in the college level, high school coaches. To be able to coach because that once you get that respect, as you say, it's so much simpler to teach the game. Yeah. It's so much easier because you're not battling that that constant disrespect. Yeah. You already have that. So then you can teach the fun parts of the game because that part is probably the toughest part to teach. Once they don't have that, it's really difficult to teach that. And that's a good point. Yeah. For me, I mean, my my coaching time is normally one-on-one with my arm around a kid absolutely just talking in his ear you know we're close we're looking at each other in the eye and there's buy-in at the end of the day so you know for me i I love being in the dugout when our hitters are on offense when we're hitting i love being right there with the on-deck guy coming up and just like starting the conversation of you know maybe they weren't paying attention to the game but now i can lock them in and tell them what's been going on what this pitcher's trying to do you know do we have something on him that kind of thing and and he gets on deck and he's got confidence. And, you know, com- you don't give kids confidence by yelling at them and constantly, you know, telling them that they're not good. Um, you don't have to sit there and praise them all the time. But, you know, just just subtly, subtly giving them a little bit here and there to, you know, keep them coming back and keep their drive going. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, and I think as a coach, too, uh, and you said it, and I, I totally agree, like the, the coach that cusses and just screams all the time. It loses its impact on a player, but if you get a a, a a a good coach that is, you can tell he's caring about his players. He he, you know, he loves the game. He has passion for the game, but he coaches it well. When and I only lost my cool about four times when I was coaching, and I think when I did, players respected that and they knew that they had crossed the line because i if you do that all the time you totally lose them it, yeah. it it becomes mundane it goes in one ear and out the other but if you if you when when it happens they they know it pick and choose pick yes 100 percent to uh, right to maybe lose your cool I, absolutely I can remember a couple of times one time was at caddis i think i was good yes. and i wasn't yes. playing at that time yeah. but that's one of the ones i, I think you might have split the I did. bridge I, of your nose open with i your threw my head. helmet down on hit the bench and came back up and broke my glasses and vic Giov- or uh, uh jules giovango was sitting by the garbage can he said i've never been so scared in my whole life <laughs> well jared hit for the cycle that game too and you're, you're mad that yeah that, but that. yeah but that, he, earlier in the game he was he was you know, lollygagging around, and then we had to go, ball go through the right fielder's uh, legs, and he he you know jogged after it, and we were playing terrible, and and I just I don't know I was in one of those moods I don't know it's happened to you it's just it, it catches you at the wrong time, and afterwards I look at back and say that was silly, but you know it made it made a point that you know sometimes you do that and guys guys respect that and yeah. they they do it so I. I, I agree with that. So, so your your you know your coaching style. Do you feel like you're still obviously we're all still learning. I mean, I'm I've been around a game forever and I still see things out. Do you feel like you're still learning from the coaches, from what you watch, from what you see, what you hear? Yeah, these last three years have been, I would say, my largest learning curve at the coaching side of it. Um, you know, you know things as a player. But then as a coach, it's a whole different ball game. You you don't get any downtime as a coach. Right. You, you always have to be engaged. Whereas a player, you get that second to just sit on the bench, take your hat off, get a drink of water, and kind of zone out for a minute. Where if you do that as a coach, you miss something. Um, so as a coach, I was lucky when I first got there. We, we had a really good team, and they were kind of the guys. We worked hard, but they were also just kind of the guys you could roll the balls out and go beat yeah. those teams with. So. 
that year was was good. Um, you know, we made a regional. We 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 won forty some games, I think, and that year allowed me to kind of get my my bearings as a coach at the Division One college level. Because prior to that, I'd only ever coached junior college, and the speed of the game is the same as a player. You know, it, the speed of the game in junior college is is a tick below Division One, and it goes the same for for being a coach. It just speeds up. The innings go faster before you know it. The game's completely over, and and you probably missed something you probably should have yeah. done throughout the game. And you know, learning from those times and trying to slow it down and really be the biggest thing for me is preparation. If I go in unprepared and don't have the scouting reports, my spray charts, my you know little notes, have I not talked to my buddies that are also coaches that maybe have played against this team? So doing all the prep work ahead of time is my biggest thing now as a coach, so that. When I get to the game, I know exactly what's most likely going to happen, and I can prepare our guys for what's going to happen. Yeah, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about your spray sheets and things. Talk a little bit about analytics. And I, I'm I'm not an analytics guy. I just I'm an old school guy that just uh, you know I I think analytics has absolutely taken over the game. You guys are obviously you need to do analytics at your level. Talk talk a little bit about your thoughts on analytics. I would say our pitchers use it more than our hitters do. Um, nowadays with the TrackMan and Yacker Tech and all these different systems that they have set up and installed in stadiums that literally tell you every little thing that the baseball is doing and it even predicts what it could do and things like that. We use it. You have to use it. Um, it's beneficial. Um, you know, we had Michael Grove the other day, and I talked with him about it all the time because he's got some pretty unique pitches, and I'm always trying to learn little things. But, um, you know, we use it for our pitchers to identify their weaknesses and their strengths. If they have a pitch that they think is really good, but the numbers that TrackMan spits out say, eh, that pitch is probably going to get hit, you can completely take a pitch out of a kid's arsenal that maybe he thinks is good, but he gives up a lot of hits on, and just tweak something, make it a little bit better to where – you know, the, the human eye can only do so much. Right, right. When you put the numbers on it, on top of it, it's, uh, it's funny how it works. Um, we've had some guys that don't realize what they're doing with the ball. And then once you get a, get a feeling that, okay, I cut the ball or I can sink the ball and little things like that, that's all the numbers are telling you. Um, you know, and then on the offensive side, you can do your batting averages and your on base percentage. We, we track with a lot of different things. Um, ours is one of the biggest ones we do is just quality at bats. You know, yes. You can get out and still have a quality at bat. You can, you know, do some things that maybe don't help your batting average that help the team. And we try and track those as well as, you know, can he score runs? Can he get around the bases? Does he hit a couple extra base hits? Um, I have my own little equation that I've kind of developed. It's, uh, it's a combination of uh, old runs created formula and a weighted on base average. And it's just something I kind of came up with. It's, you know, my simple mental math, but it's my way of kind of ranking hitters and seeing who are our top nine, 10, 11, 12 guys who probably should be getting the bulk of the at bats. And normally, you know, it, it lines up pretty good with, with your stat sheet, but it's just something that that I use for myself to kind of know where guys are at. What kind of um, what kind of research or scouting do you get on? Obviously, you guys are in what conferences? Sun Belt. Or We're in Conference USA. Conference USA, very very competitive conference, very very good conference. Um, what kind of scouting reports? Uh, what kind of research do you do on your opponents? A lot. We have, you know. We have our head coach, we have our pitching coach, we have our hitting coach, recruiting coordinator, myself. So that's four coaches that are all going to get on and watch video. We're all going to get on and look at spray charts, um, kind of look at some tendencies. We also have a director of player development, and he helps with our scouting reports as well. But um, nowadays, there's different programs that you buy subscriptions to. Um, one is... Um, shoot I'm blanking synergy and it's just a video system it cuts a three-hour game down to probably you could watch it in a half hour really it's every five seconds oh, okay every pitch and okay you get all the all Incredible. the numbers how fast was the pitch what was the result was it a, a single was there an error um so you can kind of watch and kind of see for our pitching coach he watches the hitters for me I watch the opposing pitchers and we cross-reference that with some different data numbers that track man's able to provide do we know 
okay, is this guy going to throw how many percentage of his pitches are going to be fastballs or sliders or changeups? And, you know, there's certain guys in college baseball that throw 75% sliders. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to go up looking for a fastball. Right. So we have that scouting report um, that's available to us. So if we get a, you know, guy coming out of the bullpen in the eighth inning and we got a runner on second, our guy's just going to sit on a slider and he's going to sit on it through the entire at bat. And if he gets it, he should be able to, you know, handle it. And that's something we practice, you know, on a, on a daily basis in our batting practice rounds so that when you get that chance in the game, it's it's second nature. I mean, that's that's incredible. How So talk a little bit about um, how the game it, with with analytics involved and um, obviously the rule changes and things that have come about in the game of baseball. Talk a little bit about the changes you've seen and good or bad from when you started at uh, Potomac State playing to now three years into coaching at Liberty. What what are the biggest changes you've seen? Two that I would say. One would be the pitch clock. We have a pitch clock um, okay. at our level. And the it's two years in now. The first year, the umpires controlled it. So it was up to the umpire's discretion to start the clock and you know stop the clock if they were to get to the uh, the number, the, the time that they weren't allowed to get to anyways. Um, and then the other one would be the uh, communication devices. So like not putting down signs as the catcher. Right. They just have these little watches that show, you know, throw a fastball. Catcher sees it. Pitcher sees it. All right, here we go. No need for a, a one or a two or a three from the where. Catcher. Where does that information come from? The pitching coach has a, a transponder thing that he just hits fastball. So he looks. The catcher looks on his watch. Yep. Sees sees slider. Okay. He knows slider's coming. They don't have to you know do touches or worrying about putting down multiple signs with a runner at second. Um, Did you just get to speed to uh, what pitch to throw <laughs> no, there? That was just my Apple Watch talking to me. Um, <laughs> But no, the, the, the two biggest things, the pitch clock and the communication, you know, we, our catchers have a little earpiece, like a little walkie talkie to where we can, you know, radio in, hey, guy at first might steal on this pitch because of the count. Like we might have little tips so he gets a little more aware he's maybe ready for it. It's, it's interesting how the game has changed and how how you watch a major league baseball game. And to, you, as you said, you see the pitch clock. Uh, only can throw now. Are you guys have the same rule on throwing over to first base? They on, haven't put that into college. So you have yet. unlimited numbers that you can throw over. Yeah. Uh, do, was was anything else changed at the professional level? Was the base the size of the base changed? Our bases or, are the same. Bases that the are old the same. Bases. They haven't gone bigger yet. They might. Um, how about uh, how about the shift? Of do, are you allowed to shift? We do. Yeah, we're allowed to shift full on. We don't have to worry about going no. past the line at second base, which is good because that's one of my jobs and duties. So that's one of my favorite things is defensive positioning. So we do some pretty crazy shifts. Do you see that? Do you see that coming? Do you see all the major league rules coming to your level? Or do you think it'll stay college? Level? I hope not. Um, yeah. Because I think it only helps us to be able to do those things. But if it does, you know, you still look at the major leagues, you can still shift to a certain A little point. bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. The bigger bases, I kind of get it. I think they're trying to add offense and add some excitement to the game. And college baseball is, for right now, only popular in the middle of end of June for college right, World right. Series and maybe some super regional, regional stuff. So, um, you know, till the day that college baseball is on TV regularly, like the Yankees and the Pirates, I don't, I don't see any of those things. Do coming. you do you think um, down the road that? The umpire is going to be a robot, uh, you know, a electronic. What are you hearing? What do, What do you guys hear? I mean, I know they're already doing it in certain, uh, mm, you know, mm, professional baseball minor levels. leagues. Yes, yeah. minor league levels. For us, it's funny. Like we could do it when we play inter squad games. You know, just against ourselves, we have the track man, and it puts a strike zone up on the scoreboard. And we can just call balls and strikes right off the scoreboard. We don't need an umpire. Wow, that's so, amazing. And it it's a it's all a calculation, so it's it's pretty pretty accurate. Um, but the funny thing is, we do get like an umpire's report after a game, so we can tell if an umpire was missing calls off the plate. Oh, so you can down. go back and look at the oh the, yeah, the, and the tracker. The umpires get it, so they get they get graded on it. And if their grade slips too low, they get drop down levels. But really, if they do good, they go up. Levels. That's interesting. That's that's very yeah, interesting. Even at the college level. Wow. All right, let's um. Let's talk a little recruiting here. I want to. I want to. In case we got some young guys or coaches that are watching this and would like some information about uh, what you guys look for uh, when you're out recruiting. Uh, obviously, you do some recruiting for Liberty, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I have this uh, 
probably in the past 12 months, I've, I've done a lot more than I did prior. Um, just kind of with some new rule changes at the college level, it gave me the ability to go out and you know, cover the Atlanta tournaments. And I actually was out in California a little bit. So been all over the place. Do you, uh, do you recruit, um, high school and junior college we do we do high school junior college and even you know we go to the transfer portal when we can okay so let's talk about a a high school um high school player what um what are you looking for in a high school player we talked about this on a radio show the other day uh what are you looking for in a call and a high school player uh when you go to watch a game obviously they need to be able to hit and they need to be able to hit the ball hard they need to be able to be able to have a strong they have to have a strong arm and they have to be able to run let's talk a little bit about the intangibles that we talked about yeah um you know i said it on the radio the other day but the biggest thing is just can they physically play as a freshman are you physically ready to play as a freshman the majority of guys aren't right and like that's what i said earlier in this this show how i would have never been able to play as an 18 year old because i was just i was tall but i wasn't strong enough and it took me a couple of years and that's that's something where you get kids that develop early. Um, you get kids in that 16, 17 year range that are, you know, just starting to hit it and you can start to see their bodies changing. You know, we go see kids multiple times. The first time you see them, they look like they're a freshman. The next time you see them, they look like they're 30 years old. And it could be, you know, over the course of a year, they, they make this jump physically. Um, that's one of our biggest things. And then the next thing would just be, you know, the ability to handle, the highest level of, I would call high school amateur baseball. Yep. You know, we, we, unfortunately we don't go and watch a ton of, um, you know, travel games at, you know, college fields. We're going to some of the bigger tournaments in Atlanta where there's a hundred teams and, you know, it's teams that have been doing this for almost 20 years of putting out the best, you know, amateur high school players. So, you know, we're not getting the top tier guys every time, but we're going to find some of the, the really good players that that are maybe the the middle of the pack on those teams. Um, but for us, recruiting is the high school ones are the hardest to get because there's so many of them. You can't see them all. Right. You're going to miss on some of them because maybe somebody, you know, that they have in their corner told you that they're a really good player and you believed them. And then you get them on campus and you realize, oh, we probably missed on this guy. Oh, okay. But then you have the other guys that, you know, come to your camp. They come to our camp. They do something that stands out. We offer them a walk-on spot. They come and next thing you know, they're in a lineup as a freshman that you didn't expect them to. And and I thought there was something interesting you said on the radio the other day. You've gone to – you've gone scouting and, and you were looking at uh, player A, like the whole – and all of a sudden this other kid, like you – he catches your eye, something he does. Yeah. And like you go back and say, Hey, listen, we, we got to check this kid out. I mean, this, this kid can flat out play. I like the way he handles himself. I've watched him in IO. I've, I've watched his demeanor on the field and that, that happens too. Right. Absolutely. Um, honestly, that's how I got. So, yeah, you know, back when I was coming up and that's something that's always stick, stuck with me. Like, don't just lock in on the one kid. There's there's 17, 18 other kids on the field also. Like, you got to pay attention to all of them. And and it's easy to cross kids off. And there's probably kids that we've crossed off that end up being really, really good players. Yeah, absolutely. So just because one school doesn't like you doesn't mean anything. There's 300 Division One schools in the country. Do you ever let, – let me ask you this. Do you ever – do you ever see a kid that, that – or have talked to a kid that – he he just isn't good enough to play at your level, which is a really high level. But you could see him playing, uh, being a really good player at the D two level, and say, "Listen, uh, you know, I, I don't think you could play for us right now, but you you've got the tools to be able, maybe down the road, and then maybe you reach out to a Division two coach or say, "Hey, listen, I've got, I just saw this kid here. I can't play for us, but I think." He would be really good at your level, and and you might even tell the kid, "Hey, listen, I, I like the way you play the game. You just don't have." whatever X factor to play for us. Does that happen? It definitely does. And it, it happens, it happens for us and we do it for other teams. That's, that was, that's what I was going to get. We, at. we get calls from, you know, friends of ours that are maybe at a, a big time power five school that, that know about a kid. And, you know, we end up getting, getting a tip on them. Maybe they're not necessarily calling us to tell them about him. But right. Right. Brought up in conversation, but no, I've, I've got conversations with multiple people that are, you know, coaches at division two schools and even junior colleges like, Hey, Here's a kid. And nowadays with the transfer portal, that kid might be available in a year or two. 
and he might make that jump that we were looking for that he was maybe missing. And, you know, nowadays every school is a junior college. Absolutely. You can transfer at any point now. Right. Um, so it's a good thing and a bad thing. We've been really lucky to retain the bulk of our players and not lose many to the transfer portal. Um, but it's definitely happening out there. Some of these schools with bigger players are getting the NIL money, even in baseball, getting a couple hundred thousand dollars and it's wild. Yeah. And I was going to ask you about the transfer portal. Uh, obviously, as you said, wild, we, we call it the wild, wild west. It's just, it's up for grabs. Do you, do you guys, as the season goes on and you get closer to the end of the year, do you get a, a sense of players that potentially could go into the portal players that are definitely will stay and be loyal to you guys or do you talk with them and say hey what are your thoughts on next year do you how, how does that work as you you know draw to to the end of the year yeah we want to be ahead of everything and we don't want to be surprised by something because if a kid tells you and in the middle of June, he's going to the transfer portal, and you were, you expected a lot out of oh, him the following year. Man, that's got to sting. You, your window to go find a replacement is really small, wow. so you got to get ahead of it. And you know, the communication is the biggest thing for us. Our players get to come in and sit down with us three or four times a year in just one on one meetings, and they get to hear the honest truth from us. Um, and that was one thing I don't remember really getting that as a young player in high school and in college that was really beneficial for me, and I see it being beneficial for our players on a good side and a bad side. Like if a kid's not good enough, he, you should tell him. Right. So right. he can go try somewhere else. Absolutely. And then if a kid is really, really good and you have plans for him, you need to keep him in your program and keep him engaged. And that's where just little one-on-one -on -one meetings with our head coach and some of our assistants, and they can come in and sit down on the couch and ask questions. And we can kind of tell them our plans for them and, you know, let them know that we, we care about them. We want them there. And we definitely don't want to see him get in the transfer portal. Do, do you, do, and I, I don't know how to word this question. Do you, do you, and I know probably the answer. Do you like the transfer portal? I do. Um, do you think it was a good idea for college sports? I think it was. I think because young kids make so many bad decisions and they make, you know, impromptu decisions and irrational decisions because of the big f fame of, you know, the big power five schools as soon as one of those schools get in there they want that because it looks good on yeah. social media and they can they can put it out there for everybody to see how good they are and then they get there and they end up sometimes never playing and it allows those kids to have that second chance to make their decision and make it the right decision do you do you think do you think a lot of players use it for the wrong reasons though i mean i if i was a good player and somebody was offering me money I'd probably take some money. Um, you know, I don't know. Would, would what you do, you do mean it? by wrong reasons? Uh, well, I guess that that's the financial I, side, yeah, as opposed to as opposed to uh, doing it because they're not getting playing time. They don't like the system. They just don't get along with the coach. Do they do it just for financial reasons? And 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 they might even be in a great program that has a lot of potential and could win a national championship, but are going to go make a hundred thousand dollars more. Yeah, it, it's it's happened. I hear stories all the time of different different players and moving programs. But you know, at the end of the day, it's it's the kid's career. It's it's very similar, like in professional baseball yeah. nowadays. These guys, you know, searching for these big contracts. Um, the one thing I'll say is, there's always a replacement. Absolutely. No matter who, you, there's nobody. That's one thing our coach says is how. There's nobody that's bigger than the program. Like even if he walks out the door today, the program keeps going with or without you. Yep. And that guy we might get to replace you might end up being better than you someday. Yeah. So it's not always about that one individual kid that's maybe seeking out, you know, the the big NIL NIL deal. But um, you know, our guys are are happy where they're at. We we have a really good program. We have the facilities. We travel well. We have a good conference and. And our guys really don't see a need to leave. Our guys aren't seeking that that bigger, better program um, because we're just lucky. We have a lot for our players and a lot for our athletes in general, not just baseball. Um, and they enjoy being at Liberty. That's awesome. Let's uh, speaking of Liberty. Let's talk a little bit about before we end. Let's talk about a little bit about the twenty four Flames. How how are you guys going to be? You never know. Well, let's talk about last year. Where'd you finish in the conference? Oof. What was your record last year? Off the top of my head, I kind of blocked out last year. Last year was a, it was a struggle. A, was a struggle. That for happens. Us. That um, happens. We were 
we were right around 500, um, which I'm not a little gonna, disappointing. It was a disappointing year. We had some things happen. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it was really good for us because we got to put a lot of young kids in the lineup that probably wouldn't have been in there otherwise. And those guys are going to play major roles this year. So on top of that, we return a really solid pitching staff, um, you know, to talk about the draft and that kind of thing. We definitely have guys that have opportunities to get, you know, have their name called in the the draft this summer. Who knows where that'll be? It kind of all is going to depend on how good of a year they have. Offensively, we probably have our most solid lineup, one through nine, and it's going to be a dynamic offense. We're going to have some – our first two guys could potentially make you throw 30 pitches to get them out. So we could have the starting pitcher – two batters into the game at, you know, 22 pitch count. And, you know, sometimes you don't even get that in an inning. So we have a good, you know, starting two in our lineup. And then we've got some guys that can drive the ball and and make some things happen with some power throughout the middle of the lineup. And then we'll put some speed down at the bottom. Um, Defense is one of the biggest things for, for our team. Pitching and defense is what we live by. Um, our, Our field plays really big. So our pitchers can get away with a lot and we have some outfitters that can go get the ball. So, I think overall, this is going to be one of our better teams. But you never know. Um, we have a we have a strong schedule again. Last year, our schedule was ranked number two in the entire country I remember on the reading strength that. of schedule rating. So, like when you do that, you know it's like every time you turn around in a midweek game, you're playing a team that's ranked in the top twenty five. Yeah, and that's fun. It keeps you it keeps you engaged. It makes you keep doing your job. Um, but it also you gonna you're gonna take your lumps occasionally. And uh, the traditionally the 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 who are the strong teams in in your conference? Conference USA has been kind of all pieced together here in the last couple of years, but the strong teams coming this year would be Dallas Baptist, um, Louisiana Tech, ourselves. Um, next year, Kennesaw State is coming in, but Conference USA was completely flip flopped in the last two years. I don't even think the teams that won the Conference USA are in, in the, the last anymore. couple of years aren't even in Conference no. USA now. So there's been some new new teams coming in, but we have a we have a fun schedule. We get to fly out to New Mexico. We fly to Dallas conference tournaments at Louisiana Tech. So that's a, a fun place, a fun atmosphere to play down there. They hosted a regional a couple of years ago, and we'll have our our conference tournament down there in June. Okay, so let's. Uh... Let's talk real quick. Uh, we're doing this show on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, you're going to be here in town for a couple more days. Then talk about your schedule. What when it cranks up? What what's uh, when you, you you? I'm sure you hit Lynchburg with your with your feet moving. Yeah, our guys will probably start <clears throat> coming back into town um, late next week. Kind of start getting back into their apartments and get in with the strength coach. Start lifting. Get back on their routine and. Um, they start classes January 15th or 16th, and then we can't start practicing until the last week in January. So that gives us three weeks to get ready for the season. So that's why we, re- we rely on our guys to do a lot on their own. Um, we can't demand them that they do anything. Everything that they do has to be voluntary, but they understand that it's in their best interest to go um, for getting themselves ready for the season. So they'll come back and have – pretty much a month and a half to prepare for the season. And then January, February 16th is our first game. We're okay. up at home against Quinnipiac. Okay. School coming down, I think, out of Connecticut. Yeah, so it gets uh, gets quite busy as you, when you get back, right? It does, and then it seems like it's every other weekend. We play at home, then we play away. Then we play at home, then we play away. So there will be some travel mixed in. There will be a baby mixed in. Yeah, uh, <laughs> going to be an ex- exciting time. Yes, it will. Uh, so let's close with uh, it, for any young player out there, Andrew. What do you what do you tell what do you tell them to get ready, prep for the season? You know, carry themselves during the year. Any advice you can give them? Yeah, getting your body in as best shape as you possibly can. Um, injuries are one thing that can be prevented just by you know a routine and, and taking care of your body and not just the strength side, but on a flexibility and a mobility side, pitchers get those arms moving, playing catch, um, trying to limit the amount of stress you're putting on your arm. Cause once that season starts, there's no slowing it down. Um, hitters hit every single day. Nobody likes to take ground balls. Everybody likes to get in the batting cage and hit. So find somebody like this guy to go hit you some fungos on a on a turf field or in a gym floor. Just 
do everything you can if if you can to just enjoy what you're doing and it's going to be over before you know it so don't just think it's a uh it's a negative being there have fun while you do it and it'll make it way more enjoyable and respect the game respect your coaches and <laughs> your teammates and adults correct that's right that's right well we appreciate andrew uh as as the first guest on coach dell's dugout talk we have we're going to present him with a four pack of pine room <laughs> a four pack of pine room lager which he can take back to lynchburg with him and when he's sitting around on a little downtime or doing scouting he can have a uh it's even it's still cold he can have a pine room lager so well, thank you. uh we appreciate andrew coming on uh what a what a great insight he gave us uh on so many aspects of the game uh, you, you couldn't listen or or uh, talk to a uh, a bigger baseball guy than Andrew Koala, and we wish him the best of luck, not only in baseball, but more importantly, as the baby approaches here in in six weeks. And as as uh, the episodes go on, we'll we'll keep you posted on whether it's a boy or girl. We may have a big contest coming up. Uh, put something uh, put something on uh, online as a contest of when when it's going to be born and what it's going to be. So again, thanks to Andrew Koala. Thanks for anybody that uh, listened and hopefully learned a little bit uh, from us. And we appreciate you. And we'll see you next time on Coach Dell's Dugout Talk. Mm-hmm.